Anxie. All right, better get to it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another live repair stream. The live repair stream means I'm not going to be editing it directly, as in when you watch this as a live stream, it won't be a compacted stream. It will be as long as it's going to be. And if you don't like streams and videos that are going to be as long as they're going to be, then don't watch them. That's why they have live on the front. All right, let's get into it. We've got a 1466 that pretty much an immaculate 1466 at that um, they had covers around it but unfortunately I well fortunately I take the covers off I don't like working with the covers on you know this bench to stop it from getting chafed up or anything like that I do use paper towel I really should create some just vinyl just you know normal PVC clear vinyl or something like that that can just drape over these board um, cases give it complete protection without actually being a sort of a permanent solution or anything like that okay uh, let's see what the MagSafe's got to tell us according to the report nothing happens there's a faint glimmer and that's about it we'll put the chipmunk in to tell us too DHJ, can you fix any MacBook or laptops without schematic? Yeah, many a time we do actually fix them without schematics or board views. We just fix them through looking at them and um, sometimes you just know through experience what the fault is and you go straight for it. Hey, Tony, Ed, Alexandra, Barry, Kenny, Optimize, Nash, Blood, Steve, Miles. All right. Let's see. We get it. And it looks like this is going to try and boot. Let's see if it... This might be an early model. In which case, if it's a 3437, it'll do this one more time. And then it should... Nah, uh, no. That's holding out. Ooh. If this is a... And we've got one and a half amps, that'll be the battery charging. The orange light is dimming slightly. So that's something to take note of. So I tried to start up. It's, yeah, interesting. Alright. Slightly different. Seems like it started up a little bit longer than what they reported. They were reporting that it uh, just glimmered up, you know, a little blink. So it means we may have corrosion somewhere, and then due to the shipping process, the corrosion has now changed its nature a little bit, and it's staying on for a bit longer. If it's a 165, I've got genuine fear for it. It may be the dreaded um, start-stop fault on the 165. If it's a 3437, I've got a little more hope for its life. See, saw a lot of Northridge fix videos. Do you fix any of the Scout and use thermal cam voltage? And, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, you can do it that way. The question is whether it, ah, uh, it's a 165. Oh, dear. Okay, 165, its chances of actually being fixable have dropped by about 50%. Okay, this is a 1010. Because that sort of behavior is actually symptomatic of a fault that we really don't yet have a solution for, other than thinking that it's probably PCH or CPU related. Still, we'll give it a go. We'll have a look. There may be corrosion, and that may actually just save us. Uh, DHJ, yeah, I mean, Northridge Fix, he does um, a number of them like that. Like I said, we can all do them like that. It's just sometimes it's quicker to use schematic and board view. Familiarity with the equipment also helps a lot. Let's see. The inflation here in the US shows no signs of slowing down. How is it there? We don't really have any inflation at the moment. We are seeing how the Australian dollar is starting to take a bit of a a hit, which thank God. It's been way too high for too long. 
And the reason why the Australian dollar is starting to get a bit weak now is because with China slowing down due to its various issues, Australia's coal is on the naughty list. And so, you know, China's not buying our coal and that's more for political reasons than anything else. And then the Brazil production of coal is about to start picking up again. So there'll be even less incentive for people to buy our coal. Um, and overall, there's a lot of pressure pushing down on the Australian market, mostly because Australia, for the a big portion, is actually a one-trick pony. We basically, all we seem to be able to do these days is dig stuff out of the ground and export the raw material. We barely even process the ore, which is a real travesty. There are some places that still process the ore in Australia, but we just sort of became a country that just likes to dig stuff out and ship it off to someone else, and it's biting us in the backside now. But, like I said, on the upside, if it tanks the Australian dollar, if it hits it down to, say, I don't know, 65 cents, low would be nice, so 55 cents would be fantastic, then it helps exporters a lot more, such as myself, while at the same time it doesn't really severely inhibit the domestic market, at least not the short term. I prefer Louise method. Swear a lot, just after my false sense of security of Bob Ross. <laughs> yes, I've noticed Lewis has taken a, taken to doing a few Bob Ross style videos. I gotta admit it, it is a little bit unnerving when he does that. So Where's the real Lewis? But I know, he's trying, he's trying. Not that he needs to. Farmers got agricultural equipment right to repair exemption added into the DMCA, but it looks like John Deere snuck in a line excluding subscriptions. Ah, yeah, I was going to say, most of their stuff is subscription based. Yeah, you got to love it when your best hopes right at the last second get watered down and it's usually only one or two words that are added a bit like the um, COP26 when they changed um, what was it um, uh, I think the word they changed it to was soft targets now or something like that anyway basically to imply that really there was no it all was essentially worthless. Which is pretty much how it always goes. I don't even know why they bother spending money on these great big gatherings. Not a lot gets achieved. And you probably find that the private market will take its own initiative at some point because someone will find that there's a dollar to be made in it. Which is pretty much what has happened. All right. Top of this board looks downright immaculate. I can only hope and pray that the bottom of it's got something nasty for us. And looking at this plastic here. Oh, score. There's a bit of bug pee. And there's bug pee. So there's a couple of bugs that have been in here. They may have just saved this laptop's life. Even though they actually caused the problem. Did I see something about Croatia there? They jerk from Croatia. Alright, so in this particular case, it's going to be an example of not having to use a board viewer schematics. At least, probably not. Hey Max, Andre. And speaking of subscriptions, being a load of Bahoni. That is why FlexBoardView is not a subscription-based software. It is a buy it once and you own it. You can upgrade, that will cost you, but it is not in itself a subscription-based program. So, okay, so we've got backlight issues, potentially. It's not going to be the one that's causing the problem. It's this one here that is, and for those who know, 
this is the all sys power good area so what's probably happening is it tries to get started up to SO state and this here ruins its day and I'm putting it down to bug P because I can see no swept in ingress of liquid anywhere and we all know from genuine hard evidence that bugs certainly do in fact get on these boards and wet themselves occasionally we know that for a fact we have it on video the proof is irrefutable okay we'll do the all sys power good first looks pretty nasty we may have a trace failure there it's hard to say this one's definitely going into the ultrasonic cleaner Now, be blood. That's because modern day circuitry is pretty good with preventing most of the other issues like power surges and things like that. And modern day circuitry is quite reliable, exceptionally reliable, really. So you do tend to need an external factor to come in to cause problems. And the most common external factor tends to be environmental type stuff such as liquid damage yeah why is that pin well that one actually was surprisingly stuck there it didn't want to come up even though there was ample heat there hey JBV going to New Zealand just waiting for your visa Oh no, 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 no. Nobody visits me. Nobody visits me here. No. Uh, I appreciate the sentiment. But even Lewis would get kick, kicked back if he came around to visit me. I'd tell him to go take a hike. I have very real reasons why I don't have visitors. Not to mention, yeah, most people die before they even make it here. So, like I said, I appreciate the sentiment, but. Visitors are a no-no. And it's nothing personal to anyone, it's just... I can't handle them. Like I said, even Lewis will get kicked back. Scare me to death doing that. Uh, that. See, that's a problem, that one there. It's like we lost half the trace there. So while it was a simple little bit of corrosion here, it does have a lot of issues that we're going to have to fight with. So we're going to have to bring out the knife slash away. Hey, it's Mr. I got electrocuted across my jewels. Well, you didn't get electrocuted, you got shocked. If you're electrocuted, you'll be dead. Although that's one of those words that is sort of having its meaning change through excessive misuse. People use electrocuted when they really mean shocked. So, given that it's the English language, I guess we're not overly shocked that it has happened. Jason from SDS has been doing some serious upskilling. The man can now do CPU replacements on iPhones. 
clearly he's got too much time in his life to be able to, you know, spend the time up, upping his skills. You're making us look bad, Jason. Wow, this is one of those nights where I can't focus. Hey, Travis. Steve. You sorted out your 30, 40 year old Tebow unit? My what, what? My Tebow unit? What's my Tebow unit? Hey, Keith. What I will, however, do is I will attend some gatherings in a public place where I know I can escape at will and it's not too far from my home. Spain yeah I think I've broken my tip off off in this one it doesn't really feel properly sharp yeah, I'm particularly worried about this pad here because I'm it's pretty much like I'm down to a little bit on the top of the veer stalk and that's about it this corner pad here, not so much of a trouble. It's just uh, oxidized solder that's sitting on the top there, making it look grey. But it's not really in itself a problem. I scratch that up, and I can, you know, get some fresh solder on there. It'll be fine. This test pad isn't really a problem. It's just an isolated test pad. But I do want to, you know, clean it up a little bit. Now I also want to knock away any corroded conformal coat because it just hides whatever it was that's corroding things which means even after you ultrasonic it it'll go right back to corroding or your ultrasonic may in fact start the corrosion again because if liquid gets underneath where there's a gap then uh, ultrasonic liquid as you know is fairly caustic and while it's great for taking flux off it's really not something you want on your circuit board long term. That's why you've got to rinse it. And if you don't rinse it, you'll find out what happens. Oh, Steve, right, the Tebow view. Yeah, yeah. I thought that might have been, but you said 34 year old, so I'm not sure what you meant by that. It's going well. It's going to take, you know, it's a lot of work ahead even though I've got the outline coming out now believe me that was the easiest part of the whole decoding but yeah there's some fundamental aspects that are now clear which makes it a lot easier like when you can when you know what sort of number format it uses and things like that it all just bit by bit it's like trying to solve a murder bit by bit you sort of get a better picture of what's going on and eventually you can you can win. I'm just trying to improve the solder quality around here. Alright, now I'm going to remove all of that again. I know, it sounds ridiculous. It's kind of like painting. If you ever do painting properly, you'll know that you do a lot of back sanding so that you can remove all the little bubbles and bits and pieces that make the surface imperfect. I will make a note now that when it comes to painting I don't ever do that. <laughs> no, I just keep on adding layers. So she'll be right mate, yep. No worries, I can live with that little bobble. I'm not sanding this bastard back. Ain't got time for sanding back. If you got time for sanding back, then, well, good for you, but I haven't. Yep, 
read above the phone issue I have. Took four weeks. What? Oh man. Why do I have to go back and read other people's stuff? Finally got my phone out of warranty. Out of a warranty job that took four weeks to complete. QSL repairer in Sydney. Repaired the main board on your Nokia 20. Random chip issue. Should have taken two weeks. Guess these things do happen. Because I had to order a pass to a different country. Yeah, that sounds normal. Uh, glorious South Africa, where every election it promises to fix up the re it's just a perpetual revolution state of mind in South Africa really. Every time, yeah, you know, whenever you look at the political advertising campaigns and stuff that or anything, it's all it's all basically it's all based on the idea of them being. A revolutionary party and revolutionary parties generally do not make good governing parties they make good parties for you know change of government but typically once you achieve that you need to throw out that revolutionary party and replace it with one that's somewhat stable but poor South Africa is still stuck for 25 years on Hey Wayne Noobs. So it's almost like South Africa needs another revolutionary party, one that's willing to step out of the way once the change has happened. As long as it's not the, um, what is it, the EEV or whatever Julius is in. Oh my god, that guy's crazy. Funny to think that he was in the ANC Youth Party or whatever. So much for loyalties. Ah, Wayne, it's all a trick. Believe me, it's all a trick. It's just a case of I've got my wrist resting on things and... Uh, if you ask me to freehold this in open it yeah without any propping or resting it would be as shaky as you would expect ach nie man was was Yeah, I'm gonna have to guess that's probably a ground there. Which is why it doesn't want to reflow. Hey, awesome woman. Welcome. Oh dear goodness, no, no, no. I would not want to be president of South Africa. No thanks. That's a not a job for the faint of heart. Because you know you're not going to please the people. That's the problem. Because you're going to get in on populist policy, but you're not going to actually do anything about it. Uh, Rose Electronics. Well, they all seem to be much of muchins with the microscopes. Just be aware that the heads are all 0.7 to 4.5. And the different magnifications, you know, ach, niemand. The different magnifications you see, they're all just functions of the barlows that they ship with them. But you do have to switch the barlows if you want to change the range. So what I recommend is, well, what I have here, I should rather say, is I have the standard head and then I have a 0.7 barlow. Which is good for working on, you know, MacBooks and things like that. 0.5, I find your head rises up too much above the circuit board. Zero, or one rather, which is um, no barlow. It gives you superb clarity, but unfortunately you don't get a lot of room between the bottom of the lens assembly and your workpiece. So 
So most people seem to compromise at 0.7. Hey, Pachamba will be? Thank you. I'm good. Well, you know, realistically, I've got a crap ton of things that could be better, but also realistically, I have a house, I have a roof over my head, you know, I've got food. Things are good. Things are genuinely good. Oh, Miles, wow, pulling, uh, pulling the old Scott Morrison from a couple of years ago, eh, with the bushfires. That was a good trick. I think his greater trick, though, was when he forced people to shake his hand and stuff, and I was like, oh. <laughs> but the trouble is, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much guarantee you, they're going to get re-elected. Nothing's going to change. It doesn't matter how crappy you are like that, you're still going to get voted in. I'm just moving this resistor because there's a little bit of copper. Uh, okay, I see what it is. I thought it was a, a shard of copper from my scraping, but it's actually exposed circuit board. All right. Okay, so that area is fine. If we plug this in now, it probably will start up, but there's, we need to fix up the backlight area first. It'd be a bit silly to do all this and then negate this particular area. I'm not exactly what sh specific function these resistors have. Um, these are the I2C ones. I think this is just the um, sense input for the power. It's not the backlight sense, that's this here. There's some nasty bug pee there. That actually really is nasty bug pee. I'd say the bug got drunk, and this was the breaking of the seal sort of point. So, you know, he'd been holding it in, holding it in, and then he got to here, and it was like, oh, I can't hold it in anymore, and he just let it all out. And so that's why it's a really big initial one. And then he probably only traveled about five minutes back to the table with his buddies to get over to here and then he's like no no gotta go again gotta go again see us and yeah then i had a smaller one there thankfully he didn't stick around much longer after that might have got ejected it kicked out by the fan and they went and partied elsewhere but yeah this being the big one this was probably the the seal breaker Ah, uh, no, no, no. Dadamar, Dadam, Dadamraz. There you go, Dadamraz. Oh, your name gives me grief. It shouldn't, but it does. Thank you very much, good sir. I see double the usual. Well, I haven't fully decoded that format yet, but like I said, we've got the key essential parts down, and now I'm. What I'm working on is trying to create a robust way of getting to the data that I want to get to. Uh, let's see. A lot of these files is like anything between 12 and 22 layers. And of all of those, I actually only need two or three. I need the top layer, the bottom layer, and the outline. That's the three. And then after all of that information, that is when I get the network names and then the part pin associations. But the trouble is, to reliably get all the way through the file, you have to make the parser reasonably robust. And right now, it's not that robust. I really should, however, just take one file and sort of cludge it, put in some you know, hard-coded figures and you know, hard-coded search for strings and things like that just so I can actually start working on the data because when you do that it gives you a sense of um, achievement when you see things progressively come up on the on the screen like right now I've got the outline and it was great it was like a sense of achievement like hey we got the outline we we're actually making progress here 
rather than just plugging away, plugging away and not actually seeing any reward for your efforts. So I'm sort of collecting as many of these Tebow view files as I can because there's a huge number of fields in there that I've got no idea. And when I say fields, they can just be one single byte somewhere in a structure and you might in 90% of the files look at it and it's like it has no influence on what you're trying to do but then in another file that one file it may actually have a key um, key change and then throws and destroys your entire parser out so that's why we get as many different files as we can and by working through all of them you get to see all the different flags or at least many of the different flags come into play Won't a robust parser be prone to corruption? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, tongue twisting for that name. Okay, well, yeah, that looks pretty okay there. I will replace this end resistor though, just in case. Just in case. In case there's a little bit of corrosion that slipped in underneath and it's quietly munching away like a cookie monster. How did I learn? Uh, a combination of everything. A combination of doing projects myself, combination of reading magazines and articles back then before we had the internet. Going to university as well for other aspects. And then just lots of general experience. Yeah, just doing stuff. So all of the above, maybe I should just answer how they like to answer these days with those sort of questions, which is yes. So which types of experience did you use? Yes. Because that is really how it is. You know, I can't attribute it to one given type of learning. I know some people say, you know, oh, you know, if it wasn't for university, this, or if it wasn't for real life, it would be this. But I like to include them all because they all they give you different different perspectives, different ways of learning. Certainly, I think the most powerful thing is having the enthusiasm. Do you have a user guide to microcomputer repair? Nope. No, but Lewis Rossman does. Lewis Rossman does have a repair guide or something similar to it, I believe. I'm not exactly sure of where it is, but I know he's put a lot of effort into it. It's about 200 pages long. So, yeah. Oh, wow, that is a mashed up backlight. Oh, come on, that resistor's worse than the one I just took off. That's tolerable. Ah, the repair wiki. Thank you. The other thing to keep in mind is that people learn differently. Yeah, some people really do work, learn better from books and documents and things like that. Other people learn better from hands-on. But like I said, certainly if you can keep the enthusiasm alive, that is one of the most powerful ways of learning. Mostly because the enthusiasm will allow you to push through what would otherwise maybe be considered boring drudgery, stuff like that. It what keep, it's what keeps you going when you haven't made any breakthroughs for three days. Hey 10 Minute Tech, welcome. Because when you first start out with say, let's say the TiVo view thing, I was making almost no progress for quite a few days and you just have to keep persisting, persisting and then you get this teeny tiny little bit of information you're like well wait yeah got one bit of information but 
you know, a day or two later, you get another teeny tiny bit of information, and it sort of slowly snowballs and gets quite a bit easier. Of course, you will run into roadblocks where you're just sort of like, well, I have no idea where to go from here. But at least you know, you've already achieved a sufficient number of things that you can sort of go, well, maybe I'll give it a rest for a couple of days, come back to it. Fresh eyes. So what is this? That's a 1.8 gig. So it's a, it's a mid-range board. 8 gig is nice. And that is a insect leg. Yes siree. I'm not exactly sure, probably cockroach. The more money I lose, the faster I... <laughs> I hope your wife... What's it? I need stuff to practice on those actually fixable, not dead CPU. Like, yeah, that can be a bit dissuading if you do get dead CPU stuff. Hey, Jack, gadgets clink. Good, thanks. That said, even with dead CPU machines, you can do your practicing of reballing stuff, and in some ways, they're useful more for that. So if you go, oh well, I've got a dead CPU, whatever. Yeah, you can practice reballing your SMCs. You can re practice reballing your camera chips. Well, this actually is a very new board because the camera chip is not the green and uh, silver cap one. So it's an opportunity to practice your mechanical skills. I'm just going to check the top side again. I don't want to just presume that this is all nice and dandy on both sides. Easy to make the mistake of thinking, okay, I found one or two faults. That must be the end of it, right? So, yeah, if only. There's also a bit of roach poop there. Yep, that's that's some cockroach poop. Miles, what happened to your SMC? Last SMC ended flying over the fence. Ah, oh. SMCs, like so many things, yeah, you just got to find the technique that works for you, whether it's solder paste and tape or two ball tapeless system or yeah you gotta try them all find which one you prefer someone oh wow look at this someone I don't know what they've done here to be honest but they've completely missed the mark and driven it right down to here I would almost consider this to be a factory hiccup almost like a bit of a misalignment or something. I don't know. It's definitely the screw for the heatsink got driven. It was misaligned, got driven, smashed into here and gouged out a bit on the board. Uh, you find you find ways to deal with some degree of shaking, but yeah, you know, if you've got severe shaking, that's another thing. Yeah, it wasn't long screw damage, it was just missed screw damage, or missed hole damage. It wasn't even wrong hole, it was just missed. Outright. Hey Gavin Brown, uh, Nick Macy. Come on, come on, get in there. I'm only putting the, th the fan in there for theatrics. I'll put the mag safe this side, just makes it easy to see. What am I doing? I don't know. Alrighty, let's get our power. Turn off our fan. And let's hope and pray we have some success here.
Green light, proper up now. Now this should not drop out. If this drops out, it's doomed. We're waiting for the green light. It's fixed. We have a winner. And that is pretty much that. So at this point, just disassemble the board a little more, get it ready for ultrasonicing. And that is what you'd consider to be a pretty normal sort of job that you would want to get. If my queue was filled up with those, I would be very happy, you know, take it half an hour, three quarters of an hour to repair it. Then of course another half hour, three quarters of an hour to tear it down, clean it, reassemble it, you know, dry it, ultrasonic it, test it, and then do all the paperwork for it. So all up, you're probably looking at about, you know, three hours of work for a given machine. That sounds a bit ridiculous, but that is pretty much the sort of quota of time you need for them. You know, it's not just the 30 minutes of repair. You've got everything else that comes with it. Okay, that's done. That's pretty good. All right. Ah, I'm sorry, any triple five. Yeah, that's really unfortunate. Well, it's 12:30, so it is time for me to scoot off. Sorry, it wasn't a long one, but it was a successful one. So I'm happy that uh, we had success. And yes, that is why I need a front end and a back end person. But unfortunately, in this scenario, at this point, I am an everything person. It's just the way I choose to do business. I could expand my empire, as it were, but I'm just not yet ready for that. Um, you got to remember also that. This isn't everything that I do. You know, I do do software development, of course, which probably means I should actually hand it off to other people, more jobs. But we'll get there when I'm better set up. For now, I'll carry on as things are. So I'm out of here. You all take care. I'll see you next time. Catch you later.